Okay. Thank you, Greg. He always gave me a good introduction. He's very good for all the work that he does in the museum. I'd like also to thank my daughter, who has uh, helped me with my uh, PowerPoint. I'm getting a bit fumbly in my old age. And I'd also like to thank my wife. She's sitting across there and talking about uh, uh, platinum uh, with the royal family at the moment. Uh, Joan and I will have a platinum wedding anniversary in September. Now, in 1930, well, let's take a zip line back to 1939. And this is the part of England in which we lived. It's called the County of Norfolk. And it's the piece that's bulbous and goes out into the North Sea. It's very flat, but mostly agricultural land. And so that's where a lot of the airfields were built. The British government decided in the 30s to start building some airfields. And they selected 35 airfields to be built, nine of which would have a paved runway. The remainder would be grassed airfields. Huge areas of grass, 40, 50 acres, mown down just like the fairways on your golf course. And the direction of aircraft to take off and landing was by the windsock. The, the control of the aircraft to take off or land was given by an older slam from the control tower. So you can see how far back we were at that time. Radio was in its infancy. And these are some of the buildings that they put up. The actual design of the airfields was one design for all. So that if you went into one airfield, you got your guard room on the right hand side, station headquarters on the other, so any guy that went from one station to another, he can find his way around. This is one of the big hangars they built. And uh, those days, they parked the aircraft in hangars. And this is a fire engine of that time. This is the type of buildings they put up. And they were of Georgian design. Not only this one is the officer's mess, but uh, the remainder of the building of that style also, and the Mary Quarters for officers and airmen. I spoke about radio in the infancy. We lived in a small village in the county of Norfolk, and uh, we had no electricity and no water, so we had to rely on other means to get a radio signal. And this is the type of radio we would have had. It uh, is powered by a two volt lead acid battery for the, the heaters in the tubes. We call them valves. And there was a 110 volt battery for the power. And we had a nine volt battery for a grid bias to control the volume. And then you had to have an antenna that went out, say, 20, 30 feet out into the backyard and about 20 feet into the air. Then we got a signal. And this is the signal we had. I am speaking to you from the cabinet room at Ten Downing Street. This morning, the British ambassador in Berlin ended the German government the final note, thinking that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock, that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, the state of war would exist between us. That I remember as if it was yesterday. In our small room gathered the neighbours, some didn't have a radio, others were out of battery, and mostly men just stood rigid, stared, they were faces were white and frightened. And I always remember that because I was told to sit on that chair and keep quiet. But the first thing I heard in that time was my mother. She was crying with her hands over her face with tears. And she was saying, oh no, not again. And there is my mother. 
She is. She was a WVS lady, and my father was the airway warden. The gentleman here just told me that his mother was the airway warden in London on the tubes. My father had a different job to hers because we were scattered all over the place. This is some of the type of aircraft that we had. This is what they call a Blenheim, our most prominent bomber that we had. We have the Hurricane, the Spitfire, and the Mosquito. This is a war room of the RAF where they controlled the RAF aircraft, especially down in North Holt. This is the control tower, a little bit more modernized now than it was originally, but that was the setup. You can see all the complicated boxes on, on the counter there. If you went in the control tower over here, it would be full of equipment, but that was what they had to control the aircraft. Of course, as soon as we had the notification that we were at war, the instructions were we must close all light from it coming out of any window. And we had to have a blackout time. And if you expose the light after blackout time, it was a fine. You see this couple here, they're having fun trying to form a blackout. All sorts of equipment was used, blankets, sheets, and what have you. And this is a car with its headlights and the screens on the headlights, headlight masks. Just three places where the light could come out. And that, the cars were not very fast at that time, thank goodness, but it was very, very difficult to see your way on the road. Because of the blackout and all the street lights were put out, we had to whitewash the, uh, the pavements at street corners with black and white so that people had a better sight of the curb and so there wasn't too many people fell over the curb. The other thing that was prominent was the gas mask. It was in thought that the Germans would continue to use gas as they did in World War I. And so immediately we was issued with gas masks. The babies had a little bassinet with a pump on the side. And when they got a little older, they had a Mickey Mouse type of gas mask. And then us older ones had the ordinary mask. But uh, my father, being the air raid warden, had to go around and check everybody to make sure that they couldn't draw air in from around the sides of the gas mask. He had a blank which he put over the filter to make sure it was sealed and had to adjust all the straps. What a job to do. This is the cardboard carrying case uh, as issued, but uh, the ladies went to work on this and they often made uh, material covers for them and all sorts of things with braid and, you know, just to make things better. This is some of the children playing in their gas masks. If there was a gas attack, we would be warned by a, a wooden rattle. The sirens would be for a, a bomber or ordinary bombs to be dropped, and there would be the siren followed by this. Now, <laughs> They're the sort of things that you take to football matches with you. And that was the only thing that we had to ward us up with gas attack. And I must say, fortunately, in our area, we did not have any gas attack from the Germans at that particular time. Now, we all had to take precautions and protection from the bombers. And uh, we were advised to build a shelter. Now, we were fortunate because our block of eight houses bordered onto a farmer's field. We were able to take a section of this field, dig a great big hole, cover it with timbers and all sorts of things. So it was a place for us to take refuge when the Germans started bombing. That was up until 
three months after the war, and then eventually we was issued with what they call a Mauritian shelter. And this is your Mauritian shelter. The tabletop is about eight feet by four feet, quarter inch metal plate, and it's supported by eight inch angled posts on there, and then you fitted those grids on the side so that when the house was bombed, the debris wouldn't go inside where you were sleeping. And we spent many nights in that for a bed. This is an Anderson shelter, because there was a lot of people who didn't have room to put them in, the, in their houses, or if they lived in flats, or condos as you call them, um, they had to have an Anderson shelter somewhere in the backyard which was available to them. And this was a metal structure, and often they would be covered in about six inches of concrete. And there are the children sitting on the, on the boards in the uh, Anderson shelter. Another thing we had to have, we had to be identified. No, nobody in England at that time had an identity card. And in fact, I believe the only identity card that people have in England today uh, is their driving license. But um, the guy from the local council had to come round with the uh, voters list and come to each house and he, he wrote each one of these identity cards out for every person there was in our village and it happened throughout the country and they used what we called an indelible pencil which couldn't be removed and so if you moved house they had to cross one address out and put another one in huh. what about this one ration books ration books my goodness me uh, we were allowed two ounces of cheese, four ounces of meat, two ounces of sugar, and so forth. And that was very, very difficult to live under those conditions with, with that rationing. Now, how I usually put this over to the uh, youngsters who come around the uh, Air Museum is, if you go to McDonald's, you can buy a quarter pounder. Now, the next time you buy a quarter pounder there, open up the bun, take all the bits and pieces of it, look at that piece there, and say, well, that's what Mick had to eat for a week. And it frightens them. Everything was on ration, coal, uh, clothes, furniture. Even when my wife and I were married in 1952, we had to have coupons to buy furniture for our little house. And going on from 1952, 1953 was when candy came off rationing. So, we, you know, 1945, the war in Great Britain or the, in Europe ended, but still 53, we were still rationed with candy. We had to have some protection from the German Air Force. This is the old type of radar that was set up around the east coast and south coast of England. It was formed by metal nets of radar screen on wooden uh, towers. They were 300 feet high and they had these metal screens on them to pick up any German aircraft. And they weren't very successful, but they, it worked. This is the old slogan. Nineteen forty, a lot of our troops had already gone out of the country to France, to the Far East, and various other places throughout the world. And we realized that at that time, if Hitler decided to invade England, we didn't have very much protection in the way of forces. And so they decided that all those guys who were not liable to be called up into the three services would have, and were on essential duties, would have to help. And we 
ends of nights. And so they first called them the LDV, and eventually they called them the Home Guard. Now, my two brothers were in the Home Guard. They'd never done any military training at all. They had a Lee Enfield rifle, 303 rifle, and they used to go and practice shooting and so forth. Um, and if any of you looked at PBS uh, a few years ago, there was a program on there called Dad's Army. That's a takeoff of the Guard. You know, it, it's 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 worth looking at. But none more for that. They did all night duties, weekend duties, and we were told we could feel safer because we had a home guard. This is one of the uh, semi-military service, the Royal Observer Corps. They would be positioned on these high buildings. Our friend from London here will, re will recognize this particular building. And he would find out where these airplanes were coming from and how many, and he would have to use a t landline telephone to inform the headquarters who would inform the people in the area which they think the aircraft were going to bomb. Because if the Germans might invade us, we had to take down the direction signs so they didn't know which way to go. We <laughs> don't know whether we thought they didn't have maps or something like that, but that was an instruction. You could see all the uh, direction signs there. And that guy is carrying all of London to put away. And there's all the signs. Oh, now we come to a situation where it's very current at the moment. We had to evacuate many of the children from London area and various places in the UK. And it was called Operation Pied Piper. And you see the police with their guard and the children crossing the street to go to the railway station to be uh, evacuated to the west or northwest, some to Canada, some to America, and uh, they were all taken and taken care of by the WVS under the codename Pied Piper. Not only did we evacuate the children, thank you to Canada because we evacuated the gold from the Bank of England to Canada so they could take care of it for us during the World War II. I hope we got it all back. Any Canadians here got gold in the pocket? <laughs> now this is going back to Dunkirk. This is one of the larger boats bringing the guys back across the channel. Of course, as you know, the French pulled out and raised the white flag and it left all the British troops to get back to the UK. There was five or six hundred thousand of them to get back. And they used every vessel that was seaworthy to bring them back to our shores. You, most of you will have seen the movie Dunkirk, but this is what I saw. The, these guys coming back like this just stood up in what they had. Their uniforms and everything were soaked with seawater. And they was given a leave pass when they got to England and some jam sandwiches and to make their way home. The women were not excused duties. Some joined the Ro Women's Royal Air, Air Auxiliary Air Force, some joined the Army Territorial Service, others joined the Wrens for the Navy, and the others went into Women's Land Army. And they went out to the farms and they took the place of the, all those people who'd been taken off the farms to produce food. And there they are gathering sugar beet. I don't know if anybody knows what sugar beet are, but it's a, a root vegetable which produces a considerable amount of sugar and that's how you have to collect them and then they're processed in the factory. The Battle of Britain, I will not go into great detail about the Battle of Britain uh, because I think it's been covered by so many books and uh, movies and so forth. I think the majority of you 
know about the Battle of Britain, but uh, we were involved in that because we was only 100 miles from London and we had a lot of activity over our area. There's the guys running to the Spitfires. And of course we got the Spitfire again and the Mosquito. And these are Wellington bombers. Uh, interestingly, the, uh, the body is uh, mainly fabric over a lattice frame, these bombers, and they were a, one of our most successful medium bombers. And of course, later on in the war, we had a four-engine Stirling. This is a tail dragger, the only tail dragging uh, four-engine bomber that we had. It was fairly successful, difficult to fly, but carried a bit, quite a heavy bomb load. And of course, this is our famous Lancaster, the best of them all. That's the one that took part in the uh, dam busters. This is uh, interesting. It's the, uh, what we call a searchlight battery. It consisted of the sounders on the right hand side of the picture. Uh, they were supposed to detect the sound of aircraft. And if they detected this sound, they transferred it to a, a screen in the middle there, and then they would put the searchlight on if it was dark, and the searchlight would set to that particular setting and try and pick up these aircraft, and if they picked them up, there was an artillery gun alongside there which would fire at the aircraft. I did see one kill uh, one Sunday night. We was out riding our bicycles. We shouldn't have been, of course. We was out riding our bicycles, and the battery down the street from us, they caught up with one of these, and they did hit the enemy aircraft, and it crashed about five miles away. So that was one of the successes. The other success we had was with the barrage balloons, especially down over the major cities. That was a de deterrent for the bombers getting close. I was talking to our friend here from London. They suffered most of the blitz, but I could tell you that every major city in England suffer some blitz, and this is our local town, Norwich, where you'll see there was quite a lot of devastation. Knocking down the houses. And there was a double-decker bus. This was outside the bus station in Norwich. That bus was just buried. Now this little boy here is what they call a parachute bomb used by the Germans, and it uh, was floated down on three huge green parachutes. And the idea of it was that when it got within 30 feet of the ground, it should detonate, and then it would obliterate acres of factories. That was the whole idea of it. It wasn't that successful, but this one landed in my village. Um, on the way to fetch our milk in the morning from the farmer, uh, whilst I was still at school, I had to take the can, the milk can, and get it filled. And I cycled into the farm, and Mrs. Saunders said, you didn't come past the lily pits, did you, Tommy? I said, yes, I did. She said, well, you mustn't go back that way. Why? She said, there's a big bomb on the meadow. The cows found it this morning, and my husband has called the police, and that's very dangerous. You mustn't go back that way. I said, okay, Mrs. Saunders, I'll, I won't do that. But did I? No, I had to cycle right past this thing, and <laughs> that's the sort of thing that I saw. And within 30 minutes, the army were out, and so close to the house, we got evacuated. We had to be five miles from it, because they were going to try and explode it. Uh, fortunately, the army had another method, and uh, they was able to remove the detonator and remove the danger. But it, they were used over in the Midlands quite a bit. One village next to us, uh, they had one in, and it landed in a farmer's field, 
and well you could put half this hangar in the hole that it left. But they, they didn't carry on for very long, thank goodness. Now, 1942, uh, we're going fast forward actually to 1942. In the beginning of 1942, it was decided that America would send us the 8th Air Force Heavy and they needed 41 airfields. Now, having all these airfields already in Norfolk, though we was absolutely full of them, they decided that our area was the best place to put these 41 extra airfields. The uh, British people were not very happy because each one of these airfields was going to take 150 to 200 acres of land which we were using to produce food for our tables. And so there was animosity between the British people and British government, but of course we went ahead and we built them. And this one uh, is in my village. Um, they tore down this, the hedges and all the trees and this massive equipment come in. We'd never seen anything like it in our lives. We'd seen horse and carts and small tractors, but this heavy equipment came in and started clearing the area to build the runways. And that's the final thing. That's the airfield called Wendling. And uh, it was on that airfield where I started work because at the end of 1942, I reached the grand old age of 14 years and there was no further school for me. So like majority of the people, uh, the guys in my class, we all had to go to work. Some went and did office work on the building of the airfield, but I decided that I would go and find the electrical contractor and uh, he signed me on to be a trainee electrician and I worked on that airfield for the rest of the war. This is the area again. It's a better demonstration of this is a board in the B-17 hangar. But you can see that's the 41 airfields occupied by the 8th Air Force. The places in white is where the B-17s were based. Those in the uh, orange uh, is where the B-24s were based. The place that I worked on is the most northerly one called Wendling. I don't know if you can see it. Can I point it out to you? Let's see. It's up there, up the top. I'm, I'm uh, <laughs> officially declared blind, so I can't see it. Anyway, it's up the top there, Wendling. That's the base that I worked on. Now, moving on quite quickly, we had a problem when the aircraft arrived because they all needed fuel to go to Germany. Each one of them needed something between 12 and 1500 gallons of gas to go to Germany and back. In England, we imported our fuel for our aircraft and uh, vehicles and so forth either from the Middle or the Far East. We had in uh, Mid Midlands a small oil well, to add two small oil wells, which really didn't produce enough gas to put, keep up with the evaporation. And so it was decided that uh, they would try and drill for more oil. Now, they had 41... Uh, People from uh, Texas who volunteered to come over with four drilling rigs to drill for oil. They brought them over, they started with four, the Germans sunk one on the way over there, and uh, the other three came over, but they were unsuccessful in getting sufficient fuel to maintain all these aircraft. And so they had to go back to the tankers. The original idea was to send the tankers from Texas through the Gulf of Mexico, through the Caribbean, across to England, but when they got into just out of the Gulf of Mexico, most of them were getting sunk, quite a lot of them getting sunk. So they decided that they would build a oil pipeline from Texas to
to New Jersey. There we go. If you look on your computers, you can find it. You call it, that's called the inch line. There are two pipelines there, 1,200 odd miles. Took uh, 300 odd days to build it, and it cost about 90 billion dollars. And so they pushed the oil up to New Jersey, filled the tankers, they went across to the uh, Atlantic, to the west coast of England where we processed it, and then we pushed it out in small pipelines into various areas. But we had to transport the fuel from the end of these pipelines to all these airfields, 41 airfields. And on each airfield we had two gas installations which uh, consisted of six 3,000 English gallon tanks and uh, they had to keep running back and forth and it was a continuous stream of trucks bringing in the fuel and filling the fuel tanks so that the big um, refueling trucks would go along there and <laughs> we want all this fuel, you see? Can you imagine how much fuel there was to be used? When you consider each base was put up somewhere in the region of 20 aircraft each day on a mission to Germany. So you got 20 times 12,000 gallons of gas. An enormous thing. Think of the logistics. No computers, all hydraulic. Not only did they have to bring the fuel over, had to bring the, the food as well and everything else that the people needed. I mean, they had to have the Budweiser's and the Bud Lights and so forth and the Lucky Strikes. I mean, they all had to come over as well and be distributed to all these bases. These are the roughnecks that came over to UK to try and build the, the oil wells. This is uh, a picture of the bombers from our base with the letter D on the tail so they could recognize which base they were from and which squadron they were from. We had the 392nd bomb group with uh, th four squadrons of 13 aircraft. We had 52. Most of the other airfields had about 30 aircraft. Now, also, taking off 20 aircraft from 41 airfields from taking off on the runway to getting up to 20, 25,000 feet was no easy matter in such a small area. When you consider the distance from London to the east coast where we were was only something like 135 miles, all these aircraft had to climb up. And now, it wasn't wall-to-wall -wall sunshine because Sometimes there was 12, 15,000 feet of cloud, and so they had to climb out. The aircraft from our uh, base went out to the North Sea, and it had to be done by the navigator. I mean, there wasn't GPS and things like that in those days. He had to have the aircraft climb out, like the aircraft nowadays, let down in a certain pattern, and they had to get up there. But unfortunately, they didn't have radar in those days, and there was friendly damage to aircraft. Either they would avoid hitting another aircraft, stall, or they would collide. You'll see a bit of that later. Again, our B-24s. Now, I had lived here a bit and came over to America this is the Ford factory who built the B-24s. Now, according to what I have found out, the Ford factory built one B-24 every 75 minutes. Can you believe that? That's what they did, to provide enough aircraft for them to continue the war in Europe. These are some of the boys from the base doing the washing and hang them on the security fence. Security fence is three strands of barbed wire, look. Nothing like a six foot fence they have, they have these days. And in the background is the farmer's house. They was that close. 
And of course they had to do the wash and brush up in the morning before they went on duty. And this is the sort of accommodation they had. They had three lights and one socket outlet in each of these Nissan huts. Uh, one, one PowerPoint of five amps only and there would be something like 30, 35 guys in each one of these buildings. And can you imagine how they lived? It was a concrete floor and if it was wet outside the, the concrete sweated and it was wet until much, much later in the war when they eventually did put some finishing on the floor to overcome that problem. The guys had nowhere to put anything. I used to visit these people uh, who were flying and I, I was very keen on aircraft and I could get in and have a look at the airplanes and talk to them and one of the guys uh, asked me why his television didn't work. He had a television like this he'd brought over with him in the aircraft and had that round screen I think it was about nine inches and it was all yellow and he said I've switched it on I've got a transformer where is the signal Mick where is it I said <laughs> Not in England. I said, Crystal Palace did start transmitting, but I said, only within a half a mile. Damn, he said, Tew! and of course, I had to throw it away. But the other problem we had, of course, the guys brought record players with them. And to play records, it was difficult because uh, in our country we had 240 volts with 50 cycles, which really didn't do very much for the record player. They could transform the voltage down to 110. But of course they couldn't do very much about the frequency. And so little Mick here had an idea that he could do that put on a post in one of in most of the record players. I could put a little sleeve on to change the speed of it. We didn't get it exactly right, but they could listen to the music. And these guys are looking at the mail from home coming into land. He looks to see it as if he's got all three wheels. Not all of them did when they come into land. And this is them lining up for takeoff. They would have a takeoff time in the morning and they'd start up and the takeoff time and they would peel in from both sides of the perimeter track to the runway. They'd have to do their engine run-ups on the way to the runway and once they got onto the runway, they then put on full throttle to test the engines out and let the aircraft go. They were, didn't have time to do any checking at that time. They had to go. If they couldn't take off or they wanted to abort, they had to still go and turn off at the next runway. And the guys you'd see sitting at the waste gun ports and we'd give them a little wave they wave back, you know, are we coming back? And the same with the pilots, you know, they'd be with their hands out, giving you a little wave before they go. And one thing that impressed me was the way, when they went to the aircraft in the morning, they went out by truck. They had to take their guns with them. They had to pick up, if they was the lead aircraft, they had to pick up a Norden bomb site, which was controlled by the MPs. They would go out and get their aircraft all ready, everything set up. They would come back out and you would see some of them having their last lucky strike. Others would be on their knees saying a prayer. And that was what we saw, I saw as a boy, and those guys going off to protect us. These are general pictures of the uh, Noah's Ark. That one has had a bit of a gash. And there's always time for a little bit of relaxation. This is the combat officer's mess. Like many of the buildings on the base, it was built with uh, just ordinary three and a half uh, three and a half, uh, three inches high, four and a half inches wide, nine inches long, brick on brick, and then plastered over. But every once in a while they had to put a straining post uh, to support the wall. And this is the combat officer's mess.
This is the bomb dump. These bombs used to be delivered in boxes, and you'll see what happened to the boxes in a few minutes. But this is in what we call the honeypot woods. It was full of nut, uh, pe and, oh, can't get it out, wood nut uh, trees. Uh, they were quite low, and it caused the camouflage uh, from the enemy seeing all those bombs. But that was way away from the runway because they didn't want the Germans to, to bomb it. Again, the Nissen huts, or Quonset huts, I believe is the correct name. This is rather interesting. This was right in the middle of the uh, airfield. This is Mr. Scott. He was an elderly gentleman. He was about six foot six tall, huge man. And um, they came along and said, Scotty, you'll have to go. He said, I'm not going. This is my farm. I'm staying here. He said, they said, well, you must go. And there was a lot of problems trying to get Mr. Scott to go. Eventually, he won the day and stayed in his house. And this was right in the middle of the technical site. But they said, well, you can't have your cattle. You can't farm the ground. What can you do? I can provide you with eggs. And so he turned it into a chicken farm. And that barn there was his chicken farm. And he supplied the boys with as many eggs as he could. And, but they did stay there for the rest of the war. Again, the, some of the buildings. This is the hospital ward. It shows it very empty at the moment, but I can assure you it wasn't always as empty as that when the aircraft came back. Of course, if they came back with uh, injured people on board, they would fire out red very lights, and they would let them down first. The ambulances would go along, pick them up, bring them in here for triage, and then they had a central hospital to take the more severely wounded people to them. But we were working in the hospital one day and we had all these people coming in, so we downed tools and helped the guys carry in the, the stretches with these guys. The first thing they wanted was a cigarette. Give me a lucky strike, you know. And I said, well, no, you mustn't have that. Come on, boy. He said, you can get me a cigarette. Come on, Limey, get me a cigarette. This is what the uh, boxes were used for that the bombs came in. The, they built their own shacks out on the dispersal sites. This is the, uh, the flight office, flight planning. This is the briefing room where the map went up on the wall to say where you are going today. Under construction. This was one of the problems we had on the airfield. A, we believe it was sabotage. It was the aircraft that was parked next to one of the fuel installations. As I said earlier, there were six 3,000 gallon tanks buried in the ground, and they were usually full. And this aircraft, for some reason, caught fire. They believe it was sabotage. The idea of the Saboteur was to burn the aircraft and hopefully it would get to the gas installation and the whole area would have gone. But fortunately the firemen were able to keep the installation and we just lost the aircraft. Congratulations on medals. and This is a, what we call the caravan on the end of the runway. There was an observer in here watching all the aircraft to see if he could see or hear anything untoward why the aircraft should proceed, and then he would automatically tell the control tower. This is the control tower in the late evening sun, and next to it is the fire station. You won't believe that, would you? Another missing up fire station. This is the same control tower. This is the senior officers of the base waiting for the return of the bombers. They would group up there to see them, to see how many and which aircraft returned.
And of course, there's always a lot of sadness when the crew chief stood at his dispersal point and waiting for his aircraft to come back, and it didn't turn up. It was a sad sight. They'd lost another aircraft. I mustn't pass around the bottom here. We also had a little problem with the snow. So we had to manually remove the snow from the runway so that the aircraft could take off. Not anymore. I see the snow movers that you have here are somewhat different to this. This little building here, believe it or not, was the store which they used for storing the Norden bomb site. That was supposed to be secret at that time, and so it was a, a reinforced concrete building, and it was guarded 24 hours a day. And when the guys picked up their bomb site, they had to be, have the MPs with them, take it to the aircraft, and if they returned, bring it back to here and sign it back in. Norden bomb site. There's a good display of the Norden bomb site in the B-17. One of the first computers, actually. This is a, a man-made mound where they had to use to test the guns. Uh, it was very essential they had something like that to test the guns. Anybody recognize that guy? Yeah, Glenn Miller. Glenn Miller. Yes, he visited our base and uh, we had a little chat. The aircraft arrived on the pan near the, if, uh, near the hangar. They had already erected some scaffolding in the corner of the hangar for the band to go on. We saw the aircraft come in. They opened these huge cargo doors on the side and out came all these spanking new band covers, you know. The big drum had a huge, but all the instruments were, were new and magnificent. And they came in, they unloaded them, they got them up down there and started practicing the way. Then I had to go back and get on with my work, which was I was filing a hole in a metal box 20 feet up the gantry and I was making a lovely noise as you can imagine to scrape in the metal when something hit me on the shoulder and I had to I looked down and I saw a American army officer's hat you know the big eagle and I said what do you want you'll hear you'll have to stop making that noise boy I can't play music I said well who are you he said, I'm Glenn Miller. <laughs> Dan, right, yes, if you're going to play music, will you play music for me? He said, yes. String of pearls. Yes, he said. And he stood there and he said, wait a minute. And he got out two tickets. And he said, there's two tickets. Look, you come tonight and listen and you can hear us play all the songs. And there's one for tomorrow night as well. Now, unfortunately, when I was in the army, my parents moved. I didn't see where those tickets went. Wouldn't they be worth something today? So we listened to him, and I went back that night. Uh, and the hangar was reasonably full of guys listening to the music. The second night, it was only half, em half empty or half full, whichever you like because we'd had a bad day of losing aircraft and there were so many people upset about it all they just didn't come to hear the music. That's what happened during war. This is the aircraft which you enthusiasts would think is a B-17 and I hunted all over to try and find out where this B-17 was with a cargo door and one of my colleagues in the European hangar helped me out. We found it was a C-108. Boeing made 12 of them. Two of them went for Glenn Miller. The other 10 were used by senior officers as flying officers and some of them were used with, as passenger aircraft. 
In fact, they could put 64 passengers in there, and that was a lot of passengers to carry during the war, but there was only 12 of them made. And this is the aircraft which Glenn flew in, and that's the type of aircraft that he was lost over the channel. And unfortunately, we never heard or know what happened to Glenn, unfortunately. Okay, the method of transport, everybody wanted a jeep, but a lot of people had to be satisfied with a bicycle to get around the base, because it was long distance. Uh, the airfield was miles from the accommodation, so they had to have bicycles. And they imported thousands of bicycles. And unfortunately, when they decided they had to leave, our customs people would not allow them to sell, out, sell them to the British public, so they laid them on the runway and ran over them with a the bulldozer. It made us cry. These guys are having the traditional fish and chips out of newspaper. And this is typical of the, the boys going to the pub, drinking that warm beer that they didn't like. <laughs> Have I got time? Yes. And of course, this happened as well, the GI Brides. Now, at our base, they, the local council, our village council, which my father was the chairman of, uh, donated an area of land in the middle of what was the, the airfield cross roads uh, for them to have a memorial. And they built this obelisk. And it is in memory of all the airmen who served and lost their lives at Wendley. And there is a service there every Veterans Day, we call it Armistice Day, Veterans Day, and they have a, um, an Air Force chaplain and usually somebody from the Embassy in London to attend. Uh, like that, uh, surrounding the memorial and pay their dues to those wonderful men. Each section had its own plaque. Now this has come back to personal again. This is Beeston, my little village, and the show of the church. That's the village sign. This is the village church, built in the 1700s, and the spire was added in the mid-1800s. Inside the church, take note of the cross in the foreground. On the base, we had one building which was built in a similar manner to the other buildings, but it had a sprung maple floor. It was a dual-purpose build, building for a gymnasium and a church. And this was the cross that was in that church. And it was used all the time there was, it was occupied. And when it was decided to leave, they had a procession from the base with our local minister and the chaplains, and they carried the cross and took it up to our village church. And there it stands, rededicated to all those airmen on the base. And it's there today. This is the local pub where they used to go down and, as I said, drink the warm beer that they didn't like. But they, they used to take the bicycles down there, have a few pints of beer, and then forget they got them. And the MPs used to come and pick them up leave the bicycles there, when they went down the next time, they, were, they had to buy them back again. <laughs> and this is the local railway station, where a lot of them arrived. Something like Palm Springs Station, isn't it? <laughs> and this is the Church of Sandringham. Two guys there, or a guy there talking to the priest in Sandringham. It was a very short distance from where we lived. Ah, 
They're celebrating the VE Day. Look, look at them. That's in the mall. She looks happy, doesn't she? And there is himself with King George and Queen Elizabeth. And I was fortunate enough to be, I, when I served my time, under King George VI. This is in the, with the uh, century. This is the cemetery close to the town of Cambridge, the university town of Cambridge. And it is kept like that always. May those who paid the ultimate price Rest in peace. There's that guy who did his national service. After national service, I was able to work again then for the American Air Force. They had named themselves in 1947. And this was some of the aircraft that we had. And it was the start of the Cold War in 1949. On one of the bases which we closed down during World War II in '44 to extend the runways, overlay them and so forth, ready for the B-29s to come. Either we didn't get them finished quick enough or the B-29s were not ready to take part in uh, World War II. They didn't get there until 1949, as I said, where we had problems in Berlin and that was the start of Cold War. And this is one of the aircraft, a very old American jet, the first four-engine jet, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure there's people here will tell me. That's an RB-45. This is... Let me stop it. Can I hold it there a minute? Yes. Um, in 2012, the last time my wife and I were in England, uh, there was a uh, invitation for us to go to this memorial service in a village not far from us. And it, it's uh, something that I think it, uh, speaks for itself. I'll play it now. In the small Norfolk village of Garveston, there's a strong affinity with the United States. They symbolize a special, or should I say essential, relationship between the United States and the United Kingdom which drew even stronger this afternoon with a special service to commemorate the lives of 10 American airmen killed here 68 years ago. Sons, brothers, and cousins disappeared in a ball of fire three and a half thousand miles from home. They were on board a Liberator that took off from nearby North Pickham. Bound for bombing mission in France as part of the D-Day operation. Within minutes, the plane was forced to swerve to avoid another aircraft. It stalled and came down on an empty cottage in Garveston. There were no survivors. Exploding bombs also killed two American firemen tapped in the blaze. This was the ninth mission this particular crew flew. They were part of the 492 bomb group whose casualties were so heavy it was disbanded shortly after the tragedy in Garveston. Relatives of one of the airmen who died had flown over from the States for today's ceremony. Paul de Brewer was a gunner on that fateful flight, and it's thought he took the photograph of the group. Just 20 years old from Cromwell, Indiana, he's pictured here with his niece Naomi. Sadly, she wasn't able to travel to England, but her sister Nancy and other members of the family from across the various states spoke to me about their sense of pride. It's not just a de Brewer family situation. America needs to know that 68 years later, we are still being thanked by the British. It is monumentally important. The village of Garveston has always felt it owed the Americans a debt of honor because of what happened here on June the 4th, 1944. It organized the funding and the creation of the memorial. I think it's of fundamental importance that we remember the sacrifice because 
these young men came a very, very long way to help us in, the, in our hour of need. And a goodly number never went home. And I think that has to be remembered. The other thing is that within this small village and communities like this all over the UK, incidents like this was, was in the rural areas brought the war home to people. George Washburn was an American liberator pilot who served in East Anglia. Cynthia Hamanowski now lives in the States but was born in Galveston and remembers the crash. We were hearing of these things practically uh, every week, you know, with crashes. And, um, it was different. You know, if it happened this day and age, it would be sensational news. A number of reads were made, one of them by Jimmy and Sam the brother. They never knew their great uncle, but today they were ensuring that he and his colleagues on that Liberator flight will never ever be forgotten. Thank you. Thank you.